What's up YouTube? Last time we looked at Jules Bianchi, now we look at Lance Stroll and yeah the script turned out to be rather long, nine pages so the timestamp doesn't lie. Last time we looked at Jules Bianchi and we discussed how we care about our dead loved ones. This time around we will focus on a driver who is very much alive, Lance Stroll. We will look at how uh, we look at paid drivers and exactly what they are and why Lance doesn't really deserve the hate he's given. Let us first agree that Lance Stroll is the embodiment of what it means to be a paid driver. A paid driver is someone who has a seat in Formula 1 or any other racing category due to the backing of a sponsor, whether it's in the form of a very rich businessman or a large company. Some of the most notable paid drivers in recent history include Lance Stroll, backed by his billionaire father Lawrence Stroll, the infamous Pastor Maldonado, baked, uh, backed by Venezuelan petroleum company PDVSA, and also someone you might not expect, Fernando Alonso. He has been backed since the beginning of his career by Spanish bank Santander. Not all paid drivers are bad drivers or under serving of their seat, uh, it's just more difficult drivers for specifically backed by an F1 team for the explicit reason they are talented drivers. So far only 4 teams can produce academy drivers, Mercedes, Ferrari, Red Bull and McLaren, and some notable academy drivers include Lewis Hamilton, Lando Norris and Nick De Vries backed by McLaren, Jules Bianchi and Charles Leclerc backed by Ferrari, Ricardo, Verstappen, Gasly and Vettel backed by Red Bull, Ocon, Verlein and Valtteri Bottas backed by Mercedes. If you've noticed, academy drivers can, and sometimes do, cut ties with the team that saw them grow, such as Lewis Hamilton leaving McLaren for Mercedes, Checo leaving the Ferrari family for McLaren, Vettel leaving Red Bull for Ferrari, and more recently Ricardo leaving Red Bull for Renault. But back to Lance. This is entirely on a personal note. As a gay man, I find myself unable to dislike Lance Stroll for the simple, simple reason that he is a very, very beautiful man. Taste may vary, and we'll come back to beauty in just a minute. But for now, let's look at Lance's achievements. Beauty aside, is a champion in Formula 3, having won the title in 2016. That was a sufficient merit to earn himself a super license. People may point out that team orders were involved and teammates were paid specifically to let Stroll past, but here's the thing, you cannot win a championship on team orders alone, even if your teammate is paid to be your wingman, you still have to contain with everybody else and that takes some talent. Sure, you've got an advantage over everybody else, but a driver like Andrea de Crasheris would not have been able to pull that off. I do not follow Junior Formula, so I cannot say for sure exactly what happened on then or since. But the thing is, even if your teammate has your back, nothing's gonna make you a champion if you don't have at least some talent. Now on his coming to Formula 1. Elihi, in his 2017 season, he got caught up in a crash with Sergio Perez, which is one of the reasons his haters give us as to why he is terrible, but let's also point out that he wrestled his Williams in Canada from near the back of the grid to P9, much a similar achievement to Jules Bianchi in Monaco in 2014. Sure, the terrible car was McLaren, Honda and Sauber and Canada does allow for overtaking, but it's still a very good achievement. But before we go on to discuss his most famous performance, let's consider this question. What does Lance do best? If your answer was nothing, then you're absolutely right. That does not mean he is not good at anything, but that he's brilliant at doing nothing. Spending the entire race just strolling around the circuit. That can keep you out of trouble and allow you to climb a lot of positions when the people ahead of you crash. Well, call this action of strolling around the track the Lance Roll Maneuver or doing a Lance. This is exactly what he did in the 2017 Azerbaijan Grand Prix when he spent the entire race strolling around doing nothing and as a result he avoided all trouble and kept on while the rest of the field was in absolute carnage. Lance ended up in P2 for most of the race and finished P3 after a last minute overtake by Valtteri Bottas. 
Let's note that if Valtteri had stayed behind Lance Stroll, Mercedes could possibly have celebrated both Drivers and Constructors Championship in the land of tacos and spicy food instead of still uh, instead of sealing the Constructors Championship with Kofefe. Actually, to win the championship in Constructors with three rounds to spare. You need an advantage of 129 points. Mercedes exited Japan with 540 points to Ferrari's 395 with a 145 point lead. At the US Grand Prix, Mercedes had scoring Vettel by 2 points. The advantage was 147, 18 points clear of the benchmark. That means that Mercedes would have Gafefe the, champ the Constructors Championship anyway, although with Lance Stroll finishing P2 in Baku, he would be P10 in the championship, equaling Hülkenberg and Massa at 43 points, with Valtteri Bottas' P3 remaining the same. Now let's look at Claire Williams' quote that even Hamilton would be unable to perform in a Williams car. Specifically, let's look at how Stroll would have performed in a different car. We've never seen Lance in Formula 1 in anything except a Williams, but we have seen other drivers doing the Lance Stroll maneuver in more powerful cars. Let's look at three examples. The first one is Pierre Gasly, who, after especially good qualifying in a Toro Rosso, whose performance is only slightly better than Williams, finished P4 in Bahrain as Kimi and both Red Bulls were out of the race. He qualified best of the rest and ended best of the rest, ending him the P4 spot by just doing a lance while the Red Bulls retire from diverse failures and Raikkonen run over his mechanic. <laughs> For our second example, remember how we repeated over and over that Master Chapin should change his driving style? I got really tired of all the questions, so I think if I get a few more I'll headbutt someone. Well, he very much did, even if he doesn't realize it. After that press release in Canada, he went on to deliver brilliant qualifying sessions resulting in three podiums in a row, including a performance in Austria where after qualifying P5 and a slightly be better than usual performance during pit stops, he passed the Ferraris to what in normal circumstances would have landed him in P3. However, karma reigned on the Mercedes after Hamilton being a bit of a jerk to the LGBT community. Boys don't wear princess dresses! <laughs> giving Verstappen the perfect example of how the Lance Stroll maneuver can get you the top spot of the podium without doing anything. That leaves us with the question of how would strolling around the circuit while doing nothing would look like in a silver arrow. Well, I just described what Valtteri Bottas did on his performance in the 2017 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So well managed. Very well done, Valtteri. Pulling off the Lance Stroll maneuver from pole position is a perfect recipe for a hat trick. Let's also remember that the Lance Stroll maneuver has worked in Lance's favor in the past, even in normal conditions. Not just in P P10 in Italy, eventually upgraded to P9 where Grosjean was disqualified, but also the fact that after qualifying P12 and starting P11 in Mexico, remember Daniel Ricciardo had a huge grade penalty. Some initial carnage at the Mexican Grand Prix caused Stroll to find himself P5 at lap 54 with Vettel behind him within DRS range. It took Vettel a whole lap and two DRS attempts for him to actually catch Lance Stroll. Since, you know, the Mexican, the main straight in Mexico is the most effective DRS zone in the world, but still holding Vettel behind for a whole lap, that's quite the achievement. Now on to Lance's greatest non-famous achievements. During the Monaco Grand Prix this year, while he was strolling around the back, he scored the fastest lap of the race, arguably because he was uh, the only one not having to deal with the over so annoying traffic. He did this in lap 36, scoring a 115.4, followed by a 115.3 the next lap. The next fastest lap would happen in lap 9, lap 59, when Max Verstappen scored a 114.8 and followed by a 114.2 which would stand as the true fastest lap of the race and indeed Max is credited with the fastest lap of the Monaco Grand Prix, but we 
What we remember about Lance was hearing him moaning on team radio. Oh, but the bag, this car is terrible, this car has always been terrible, we're not gonna get a good car! And indeed, he was moaning like a child. He's one of three drivers known for doing this, along with Sebastian Vettel. Blue flag, blue flag. Honestly, this guy needs to let me through, I'm a four-time world champion. Come on, get out of the way! And Lewis Hamilton. What is this guy doing in the safety car, drinking a cup of tea? While driving in the safety car? He's too slow, I tell him to go a little faster. I'm losing tire temperatures for Her Majesty's sake. We end up blaming some bad things on the drivers while blaming other bad things on the car, depending largely on who the driver is. Hence why we never blame Fernando Alonso or anything, but we end up blaming other drivers like Van Dorn or Stroll for pretty much everything. But now let's get back to beauty. Not only to compliment Lance on his looks, but to look at how we consider what we consider beautiful and why. This segment assumes that you're okay with the fact that it's okay to be gay and accept the, tr the truths of evolution by natural selection. Is every Catholic gone? Great, we can continue. Before our discussion starts, let's ground a few basic concepts. First, we will be focusing on cisgender individuals. Transgenders aren't very well understood and they make up around half a percent of the human population. Second, if a even though a homosexual man, like myself, is a man in basically every sense of the word, we will work based on the assumption that as far as the limbic system is concerned, modeling the libido of a gay man as equal to that of a straight female is a good enough approximation. If you've ever dealt with gay men or happen to be one yourself, you know that straight women and gay men get turned on largely by the same things, and the same applies between lesbians and straight men. Many of us found ourselves attracted to, to traits associated with neoteny, which is the retention of juvenile-like features well into the adult years, as Joe Hansen explained in one of his videos for It's Okay To Be Smart. It's something that we've selected for, that was selected for by our ancestors, so it makes sense that we'd find it attractive. Sure, not everyone likes neoteny as much, hence why some people like a lot of body hair, but for those of us that like a neotenical specimen over a non neotenical one, we would likely say no thanks to an excessive amount of body hair in a partner's chest. Sure, a small amount of hair is maybe good, no one's discrediting Jensen Button, but if some, but if a boy has as much as her as say Art and Senna, I would not be down. Lance Stroll is a particularly strong case of neoteny, and he, with his complete lack of body hair, uh, having the added benefit of his bodily traits standing out a little more. And he does look a little younger than he actually is. Other clear instances of neoteny in men include Esteban Ocon, Lewis Hamilton, Nick De Vries, Cameron Boyce, Bubi Stewart, and Neymar. I can't really tell such traits in women, but I'll leave that for the discussion in the comments below. And it's just not limited to the selection of potential mates, we've also selected for neoteny in our closest animal companions, which is the reason why corgis are Her Majesty's pet of choice, and why the supreme overlords of the internet are cats. If you're happy and you know, say meow. If you're happy and you know, say meow. If you're happy and you know, then you really wanna show it. If you're happy and you know, say meow. Of course, there are other traits that are also considered more or less attractive. One good example is skin color. I am from a country where it's generally accepted that an increased amount of melanin in one's skin, aka being black, is considered an attractive trait. And looking at Lewis Hamilton, it's easy to see why. Being white can also be considered attractive, and for some people, freckles are kind of, kind of the best of both worlds, and I'm among the ones who hold that opinion. But all of that is subjective. Some things are attractive pretty much regardless of culture and taste, and those are the things that I can distinguish as attractive even if those in females doesn't affect me in any way whatsoever. In both genders, a nice looking smile and, a beautiful, and beautiful shiny eyes are considered cute, back to Stroll and Ocon of course, with male traits such as well-toned muscles being considered very hot, Max, uh, Lewis Hamilton for example is a great specimen of the muscles department, this makes sense, 
since a well-toned body would have helped our ancestors survive long enough to reproduce, being more agile, fast, and therefore desirable. It also does help that Lewis has a pretty large um, power unit. Another thing that helps, or would have helped our ancestors, especially in difficult times, were energy resources, some fatty tissue in key areas of the body. This is the reason why a large bum is desirable in both sexes, and large breasts in females are also considered desirable. In fact, some people express the attraction of another human specimen rather loudly. I am guilty of doing that. Yelling or whistling or catcalling is a natural thing to do. We just have agreed as a society that we should not do that because finding yourself at the receiving end of a catcall can be very uncomfortable. That leads me to a certain comment posted as a response to me, to me pointing out that Lewis is hot. Uh, he's a human being, not a play toy, but the thing is, we kind of all are, biologically. At least those that are attractive. Sorry, Max. It's just natural to find some people attractive, to fall in love and to feel jealous, with the feel the jealousy that comes with it. But as rational beings, we should have reason in control for everything that's important. When reason is not in control, the competition for a mate can get fierce. <laughs> or even worse, get you an embarrassing, humili humiliating reprimand for a blue flag. Okay, so that was the video, hope you enjoyed it, and I also hope I didn't piss you off too badly for that. But yeah, that was my video, and I am looking forward to the Singapore Grand Prix. Hopefully, a 7 up one will be in a good car next year. It's pretty much guaranteed the last roll will go to Force India. I hope you now um, appreciate him a little better. And yeah, I hope you have a really nice day. And thank you very much for watching.